I'm going to take you through a, a quick tour of my research on optimizing performance of the brain. I was uh, originally in the brain uh, decoding section, but I think that I sort of crossed this boundary. One thing we know is that humans have been essentially consumed with high-level performance for all, all recorded history, if you look back in time. But the formalized approach to optimizing performance is very clear when it comes to physical fitness. Right? So the pursuit of physical fitness, when directed at, at this goal, is clear that it has an impact on how we engage in our environment. So if you look across the entire scope, from strength to endurance, power, speed, perceptual processing, you see that there is an improvement in our ability to perform that has become a very specialized practice. So from the point of view of looking at practitioners, equipment, and programs, there is an approach to improving physical fitness that is at a very high level. And it's very broad. Right? It covers both wellness as well as healthcare, as well as even competition. But what about the brain? What do we do to optimize performance of that core part of our function that actually most defines us as human? What do we do to improve cognition, memory, attention, perception, decision making, emotional regulation? I would say in this regard, we are tragically lacking. Traditional education has focused on transferring information content, but not either assessing or optimizing performance of these fundamental underlying information processing systems. And when we think about this from the perspective of the clinical population, of people that actually have deficits in their cognition, we see a lot of these same problems. As a matter of fact, what we really see is a very siloed approach to how we try to improve cognitive abilities of those that are suffering. And I want to be clear that I do not have an inherent problem with the molecular approach to improving how our brain functions. But I do think that there are many problems here. And after 50 years of research on trying to come up with a molecular agent to improve cognition, we don't have one single high-level success story. There are several reasons for that. The first is that there's very poor targeting. So although these agents act on neurotransmitter systems, they do not target the underlying computational unit of the brain, which is the neural network. Therefore, we have to increase doses to very high levels in order to get effects, and these occur along with side effects. First problem. Second problem is that it's entirely non-personalized. We already heard a bit about this today. Our entire system of prescribing, of building up the evidence to give someone a medicine is really built on population data, not taking into account the heterogeneity or individual differences that exist there. The other problem is that our prescriptive approach is generally unimodal. So there are some doctors that have a more progressive view of how to treat patients, but for a large part what we see is that a single pill is used, as if we have a holy grail, a way of changing something as complex as the human brain in order to lead to meaningful and sustainable effects, and we just do not have that. The last problem is that this is an entirely open loop system. So let me describe first what a closed loop system is. A closed loop system is when you intervene in some way and you record the impact of that with as low latency as possible. And then based on that information, you modify your intervention and apply it again. And you create this closed loop. We know that this is the most powerful way to change anything, whether it be a physical or biological system. But our current approach is really the opposite of that. You take a pill home with all of these problems, and you subjectively evaluate your own effects and side effects, and then come back to the doctor months later, where a non-empirically based decision is reached to go up or down on the dose. Very sloppy, open loop cycle, not a powerful way to change anything, especially something as complicated as our brain. I would say that this is just not good enough. Now, I don't really feel that harshly about drugs. I really uh, mostly thought that was a very cool effect and sort of fun to drop that anvil. But I do think that while our colleagues figure out a molecular approach to cure things like Alzheimer's disease, we need to have at least a parallel approach to correct for these deficits in our current therapeutic system. And so we need to come up with something that is targeted, personalized, multimodal, 
and closed loop. And that's what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. I'm gonna to talk to you about what we're doing in our lab at University of California, San Francisco to create this system. So there's really a three-step approach, and I'm gonna just take you through it pretty quickly and then give you an example from our work. The first is to identify what that target is. If you don't know the target, you cannot be precise at, at changing the system. Then you have to build an engine to change it, having all of those deficits corrected. And then we need to find a way to enhance the effects to even a higher level. The target. So this is our target. Um, it doesn't have to be. Uh, this is one that we think is particularly effective. And what we try to improve in our lab is what we call cognitive control. And what cognitive control is, it's a triad of abilities, our mental abilities, that allow us to interact with our very complex environment based on our goals. So these we classify as attention, the ability to direct your limited cognitive resources to things that are relevant and sustain it, working memory, holding that information in mind when it is no longer present in the environment, and goal management, what you do when you have more than one task. How do you either multitask or switch between them? And so the reason we focus on these is because we think of these as sort of the base of the pyramid upon which all higher cognitive functions, as well as our real life interactions, our careers, our relationships, schooling, education, even safety relies on. We also know that if you have something wrong with your brain, pretty much any neurological or psychiatric disease that affects cognition, you're going to find an impairment in these abilities. So it's a good target because if we can impact it, we expect to have broad impact. How do we study this? So in my lab, we use a multi-methodological approach to understanding cognitive control, consisting of functional MRI, EEG, and transcranial magnetic stimulation. And with this approach, we try to understand how neural networks in the brain underlie these abilities and how they're fragile in some condition. In our case, we have a big focus on aging, and we know that all of these skills, all these abilities decline as we get older. So we have our target. The other advantage of this approach is that we start building functional biomarkers using these recording techniques so that when we come up with an intervention, we can follow it over time and see if we're having the impact that we're looking for. So that's what our target is. How do you build an engine that has these aspects of it? Well, how you go about it is first you need a fuel. So the fuel of our engine is neuroplasticity. The fact that our brain could modify itself at every level from structure to function to its chemistry in response to an interaction with the environment. So neuroplasticity is not our engine, it's the fuel. It's, if it didn't exist, we would not be uh, uh, tackling it in this way. Right? So we're not creating neuroplasticity, we're harnessing it. The other aspect is what's the mechanics of our engine? So in our case, we use these two elements, adaptivity and feedback. Adaptivity is what, when you're interacting, and I'll, I'll describe a little bit more on the next slide of how we go about this, when you're interacting with something to change your brain, it is scaling its difficulty proportional to your ability. So it's constantly pushing you. It's also giving you feedback so that you know how you're performing either well or poorly. And the last part is how do we deliver this engine? And we do that through video games. Video games are immersive, engaging, enjoyable, interactive way of, of changing behavior. We already know that from many aspects. We think that it can be a positive source of impact, and so it's our main delivery tool. So let me put this together a bit. Something happens in your brain while you're playing a video game, and it's represented as a behavior. The video game records that information in real time, and then modifies itself, it adapts itself, as well as gives feedback on how you're performing, and that goes back to your brain and creates this closed loop. And so this is really the core of what we're doing, a closed loop approach with adaptivity and feedback as the mechanics that are delivered through a video game. Let's talk about the last part. How do we then enhance the effects? So we look at video games not as a magic trick. The reason why we think it has an impact on cognition is because it activates networks, and by using adaptivity and feedback, we can apply pressure and change that system. But if we had neural data, not just your performance data, we could add on two other elements, neuromodulation and neural feedback. In order to do that, we need to have high-resolution neural data that we can use to track your interaction with the game, let's say. In order to do that, we've developed a new technology in my lab, along with collaborators at UCSD. We call it the glass brain. You're looking at it here. And what it is, it's a combination of MRI 
structural MRI, and EEG. And this is high density 64 channel mobile wireless EEG. And you're looking at different frequency ranges and different colors. And literally within real time, with very slight delays of 200 milliseconds, we're doing source localization, where these signals are coming from, artifact correction, and an approach called multivariate range of causality, which lets us have computational models of how brain areas are communicating with each other. We bring all that data inside the Unity game engine, which is where we do a lot of our game development, and we have this really beautiful way of just navigating a brain functioning in real time. Once we have this data, we can then use it to guide the system of change, the mechanics of adaptivity and feedback. So let me put this all together for you. So 2015, you have a problem with your attention you're going to likely get one of these, which is gonna have this blunt effect on your brain and all the accompanying side effects. What we hope is literally within 20 years, we can at least reduce the dose of those medications, decrease the side effects, and then use a video game that's targeting a neural circuit to affect that system. We then hope through a technology like the glass brain to record EEG activity during gameplay to feed that into the game engine so that it's adapting based on that information and not just the performance, that's sort of the end result of, of the entire system. We also can take EEG data and use it to guide the stimulation parameters of tools like transcranial uh, uh, alternating current and direct current stimulation. So we can record frequency and oscillations in the brain and then guide the stimulation based on that. And so with this approach, we think that we can finally achieve what we're looking for, something that's targeted right, to these underlying networks that drive cognitive control. It's personalized, not just to the individual, but to how that person changes over time. It's multimodal, acting on multiple different systems. It doesn't necessarily have to occur without medication. Uh, it's possible that molecules might act to activate the system more, more aggressively. And what we're looking at is multiple closed loops going in parallel, interacting with each other. So I'm gonna give you an example from our research now about what we've been doing over the last six years. And it's uh, basically the approach of how we might improve cognitive control in older adults building a custom designed video game. So I'm just gonna give you just a very quick snapshot of this. So six years ago, I reached out to friends of mine that worked at George Lucas's video game company in San Francisco, LucasArts, and I had a design idea for a game that I thought would challenge older adults' cognitive control in a very intensive way. And that game is called NeuroRacer. It's a game that has a lot of high levels of distraction and interference through multitasking, so it really pushes, puts pressure on that very fragile cognitive control system in older adults. So we built the game, it took us a year, and then we did a three-year study to understand how it works. And I'm just gonna give you a quick view of some of the data from that paper. Essentially, we could first use the game as a diagnostic tool to see how people are multitasking on the game and see what's happening in their brain during the most challenging part of this game when you're driving the car along a road and a sign comes up. And what we find is that there's a de linear decline across life. This is not the type of skill that just maintains your entire life and then you know, declines when you're 70 years old. We see each decade of life a decrement in this ability to do two tasks at the same time. We could also use the game as a neural diagnostic. And you could see this yellow area is a burst of low frequency activity we call theta that occurs within 300 milliseconds of a sign coming up. And that decreases as we get older. It's only at the level of green, so it's lower on the power spectrum. After a month of training, so 12 hours, this is one hour a day, three days a week for four weeks, a group of 60 to 80 year olds, healthy, no Alzheimer's disease, what we find is that their ability to multitask improves dramatically, even exceeding the levels of 20, years old, of 20 year olds on their first visit. We also find that that ability to multitask sustains itself six months later without declining significantly. And other skills that are part of that triad of cognitive control, sustained attention and working memory also improve, only in the group that trains in this multitasking version of the game, not another group that plays a single task version. So we start building the design principles of how we create a type of intervention like this to change the brain in a meaningful way that has some essence of sustainability. We are fortunate that this was published at the end of 2013 in Nature, and they were very kind to us to put such a, a, a pun on their title of Game Changer. And I really bring this up to make the point that although we're very proud of this game, I don't really think that the game itself is a game changer. And I think that time will tell if there is a game changer here. But if there is, I hope that what we're looking at is a blueprint for how we can 
work with high-level professionals from an industry that knows how to build engaging and immersive interactive media, targeting known deficits in a population, and then do a carefully controlled studies with placebos and neural measures as outcomes to see what the impact is. And this is going to be absolutely required if we take this field to the next level. What we're doing in our lab now is these two studies. We have the video game. We showed its impact on older adults. Can we take EEG data in real time and use that to guide the game mechanics? Can we take EEG data and use that to, to guide alternating current stimulation to boost these effects to the next level? So these experiments have both begun already. Another thing that we realized is that if we want this game to impact people's lives, it has to leave the lab. As an academic lab, we can't really build things that are scalable and, and, and products that will get into people's lives. So in order to do that, I helped co-found a company. Actually, the folks that worked at Lucas Arts are now full-time with this group. It's called the Killy Interactive Labs. And they built a game that's a much higher level game, higher levels of art, music, and story, all things that are very important if you build a game without violence in it. And the goal now is to see, does this have impact on clinical populations? So to some people's dismay, this game is not available on the iTunes store. The decision was not to go consumer route, but to take this game into pretty extensive clinical testing to see if it, if it could have an impact on conditions such as depression, traumatic brain injury, ADHD, Alzheimer's, autism. So right now, this preparation for the first study and that is going to be um, an ADHD study to see if it could be an FDA-approved therapeutic. Right? So it just has to reach that same level of efficacy with a reasonable side effect profile of our current pharmaceuticals. So you know, only time will tell. The data will speak for itself. But we'll see over the next year or two if we're looking at a whole other class of medicine built upon a digital framework to change the brain. Lastly, I want to tell you about what we've been doing in our lab since NeuroRacer has left the lab. It's sort of like having your kid go off to college. It'll do a lot better if you don't follow it there and hang out with it all the time. It's, it's, it's you know, the job of other scientists to validate that as a clinical tool. And we're sort of back you know, in the lab with an empty nest syndrome. And it's time, you know, as we say, to make some new babies. So that's what we're doing. So we built this new lab called the Neuroscape Lab to really bridge between technology and neuroscience. This is a look. Uh, quick peek at what it looks like. This is our neuroscience building in San Francisco, and this is our lab, right? So this is a neuroscience lab. It doesn't exactly look like one, but I can assure you it was designed to be one. And so you have this as the experimental room on your right, and on your left is the control room. And so this is sitting across this wall from each other. And what we could do here is build very high-level interactive media to train brains uh, according to our different goals based on our own research, and then try to collect very rich data. So we could look at eye movement, body movement, EEG activity using the glass brain, skin responses, conductivity responses, heart rate variability. Take all that data and time lock it to events in the game so that we can start breaking down how a game like this can change the brain and cognition and behavior at a very high level. So I'm just going to, in a couple of moments, tell you about four new games that we've been working on over the last couple of years. So these games uh, all use different types of technology. Metatrain, Rhythmicity, Virtual Attention, and a game we call Body Brain Trainer. So Metatrain is a game that uses an iPad. It, uses, it basically adapts the principles of concentrative meditation, brings them into that video game environment of adaptivity and feedback to try to improve our ability to self-regulate internal distraction. Rhythmicity is built on the hypothesis that our brain is a rhythmic machine, that if we become more rhythmic, we can improve those rhythms and the coherence between different brain areas, and we'll see a benefit on our cognition. Um, virtual attention is a game that takes place in a virtual reality environment. You can see here an Oculus Rift headset along with EEG recordings. This goal is the opposite of a focused attention game. It's to use the very uh, clear advantage of virtual reality with a very large field of view and depth to help you expand your attention, distribute your attention more broadly. And the last game is a game that uses motion capture. It's the Connect 2 system, part of the Xbox One. And it's a game whose hypothesis is to see if you train yourself cognitively at the same time that you train physically. So if you have an integrated cognitive and physical fitness platform, will you improve your cognition to a greater degree than if you train cognitively alone? So all those studies are about to begin now. Actually, both MetaTrain and Body Brain Trainer began last week. 
And the goal is to do very high level validation. So that's really the challenge here. High level development followed by high level validation. Does this really work? So experiments using MRI, both structural and functional, EEG, extensive cognitive testing, stress measurements, epigenetic sleep, what is the impact of all of these over time? And so those experiments are gonna occur over the course of this year. But the biggest win will not happen this year, right? Because these things, we believe, will have a bigger effect when they work together, something that I call neuro-crossfit training, right? That if you put these together, there will be a synergistic effect. And again, trying to avoid the very siloed unimodal approach that we've seen uh, us use in the past, we want to avoid that. So that's what will happen eventually. Now, it's going to take a while until we study all of these games in isolation. So in the meanwhile, I plan on playing all of these games uh, over the course of this year. And we have no idea what will happen, of course, but I have very high expectations. <laughs> so maybe when I return, Neuroman will, uh, will appear. So uh, that's what will be going on. Now, while all of this happens, we are already working with colleagues that study a large array of different conditions where there are deficits in cognitive control. And I'm not saying that we're going to reverse the underlying pathology of things like Alzheimer's disease, but we do believe that this type of approach can improve the strength of our brain to at least delay the functional consequences of these conditions, and in some cases, maybe even reverse them. And then we just began, began another project to think about what all this means in the world of education. When we have a healthy young brain or even older brain, and we want to optimize its function. Can we use this approach to really make a difference? Thank you. Thank you, Adam, uh, now also known as Neuroman. Um, <laughs> tell me, uh, when can I stop playing your games? That's a good question. So. Um, this is like, I guess, a very sort of polarizing discussion. Many people feel that once you have a game and you could show some level of validation, it should just be disseminated into the world. Um, we, at least for our first game, NeuroRacer, have decided to not go that route, but to, as I described, go a full clinical FDA validation pathway. It's never really been done at that level. So for now, that game is not really playable, but this process is pretty fast. Unlike the normal drug discovery process, which could be a decade mm -hmm. and a half a billion dollars, we're looking at just a couple of years. So hopefully, in the next couple of years, you'll be seeing these games start starting to appear. And in the meantime, because I know you study, you've been studying neuroplasticity for decades, what kind of advice do you have for you know, our delegates, our audience, about what they can do to you know, prevent cognitive decline and even improve their Cognition. Yeah, so that's obviously a really important question. You know, while we're in the lab trying to figure out uh, a very sort of prescriptive way to change your brain, what do you do in the meanwhile while we do this? I mean, generally, um, I give the approach that uh, I sort of suggest what I do myself, which is try to do all the things that we know that are good for our bodies, right? So high levels of nutrition, physical fitness, and challenge, constantly pushing uh, your brain uh, out of its comfort zone are the type of things that I think that we should all do to keep a healthy brain. Thank you so much, Adam. My pleasure. Thank you.